Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Claire Mamara. I'm the outreach librarian here at the Alaska State Library. And I'm so happy tonight that we have with us Jim Hale. He's one of the supporting scholars for this whole first folio project. And he's been one of our most enthusiastic supporters for since the time we started writing the grant. Um, he was actually a fellow at the Folger Shakespeare Library when he was doing his graduate work at Rutgers. So he has a long relationship with the Folger. And I think that really made a difference in our application. So he's here today to talk to us about the two men who created the first folio. And I'm so excited to learn about Hemmings and Condal from Jim. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I thank Claire and Freya and everybody at the museum for, for, for doing this for us, bringing the folio here. To, quite an achievement. It's a great way to, to inaugurate the new museum. Anyway, let me start with a disclaimer. I've seen uh, in some of the ads around town for this that I've been referred to as a, a Shakespeare scholar. And, uh, that's, that's a high compliment. I was a Shakespeare scholar once long ago, but I threw over academics for a, for a federal paycheck. <laughs> so I had five kids to, to raise. So. So I, I consider myself a, a passionate aficionado. Uh, I love this stuff. I love the plays. And I hope tonight just to tell you some of the stuff I hope i not yet forgotten. We'll see. I call this uh, Who Wrote Shakespeare's First Folio? And of course, we, we know who wrote the plays. The plays were written by William Shakespeare. There's no reputable scholar that doubts that. I think uh, one of the things we'll see tonight is one of the, I think, the, the best pieces of evidence for Shakespeare's authorship. But uh, I think Mark Twain, it's, there's a line attributed to Mark Twain that puts it all in perspective. He said, if these plays weren't written by William Shakespeare, they were written by somebody else with the same name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the plays that are the focus of our interest, not necessarily the man. Although, it's, you know, in one of the interesting things about Shakespeare's scholarship is you can see across the 400 years people claiming that Shakespeare was a soldier, a lawyer, a doctor, a Catholic, a Protestant, everything. It doesn't seem to have occurred to them that maybe he was just a man of incredible powers of observation, which I think is true. And one of the reasons we have the authorship debates because there are some people that don't think Shakespeare could have written these plays without a college education. <laughs> that says a lot more for a college edu education than I'm willing to admit. <laughs> he was a, a man with incredible powers of observation. He looked carefully at what he saw around him, and he had a gift for, for language. So anyway. Uh, tonight, just in a sort of impressionistic intro to the first folio. I'm uh, talking about the two guys who were responsible for putting it together, John Hemmings and Henry Condell. And Hemmings and Condell were, were friends of Shakespeare's. They were, they were colleagues in the theater. Uh, they were actors like Shakespeare. They were uh, shareholders in the theater company, which meant that they took a share of the profits. Uh, and they really just got up pretty high in the theater company uh, after Shakespeare and Richard Burbage, the company's great tragic actor, was the first man to play Hamlet. But after Shakespeare and Burbage died, Hemmings and Condell were pretty much at the head of the company. Uh, they were then, at that time, the King's Men. They started out as the Lord Chamberlain's Men, that is, they were patronized by the Lord Chamberlain in Elizabeth's court. And Elizabeth was, wasn't particularly fond of plays. But uh, when James came to the throne, uh, he loved plays. And so he patronized the, the theater company, and they became the king's men. Uh, they were uh, Hemmings, started out his professional career as a grocer. He was attached to the, the Grocers Guild. And it's presumably that association that allowed him to develop a little alehouse right next to the, the, uh, the Globe Theater. So he had that business going for him as well. Uh, 
uh, along with Richard Burbage, Hemmings and Condell were, were named in Shakespeare's whip. They were, uh, he left them money to buy rings to remember his body. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about Hemmings and Condell. That's pretty much the extent of it. Uh, but we do know that, that seven years after Shakespeare's death, they put together the first one. And one of the things I handed out the piece of paper. That's the, this is the preface that Hemmings and Condell wrote for the uh, for the first folio. And I'm going to be reading through that tonight, and my talk's going to kind of track with the things that they say about the folio because I'm interested really in talking about what they thought they were doing. This <coughs> this book, it's a wonderful book. So the the story. Of Shakespeare's first folio begins seven years earlier in 1616. The first folio was published in 1623. But it was seven years earlier, in 1660, the year of Shakespeare's death, that the story really begins because that's the year that Shakespeare's colleague Ben Johnson published his own folio, the works of Benjamin Johnson. What's interesting about this is at this time in English culture, Plays were still not recognized as literature. Nothing like on a par with classical literature. Not like poetry or history or philosophy. Plays were just sort of pet trash, really. Passing fancy uh, pop songs, if you will. Uh, nobody thought of them as works. Plays as works. And when Johnson published his folio in 1660, Everybody thought he was the most arrogant ass in town for pretending that these plays constituted works, real literature. Uh, one of his contemporaries who's defending Johnson actually makes the connection between the words work and play. He says most men's works are play. And Johnson's plays are real work. But so this is the book, and, and you can see now this book contains a lot of uh, Johnson's other work. Johnson was a poet, a playwright. He has some prose works. But the interesting thing about this is that he's not focusing on the poems or the, the other literature here. It's focused entirely on uh, on drama. This character on the on the left is the figure of tragedy. The boots he's wearing are buskins. They're the traditional garb of the tragic. And the character on the right is comedy. She's wearing sandals. They're so called socks. And then the at top, the figure on uh, on the left at top is a satyr. He represents satire. The figure on the right is a shepherd. He represents pastoral poetry and drama. And the figure at the top is tragic comedy. And we see below tragic comedy, we see one venue for plays. Uh, a, an actual theater. Then down in the lower left-hand corner, we see a wagon. <clears throat> the players, they would take the show on the road, they walk, pile everything on a wagon, and put the plays, the stage, the plays on the wagons. And then on the right, they have an amphitheater. So this, this folio is entirely dedicated, this fuzz piece is entirely dedicated to plays, to drama. That's a remarkable moment in English culture. And as I said, it's this sort of, opens the door for Hemings and Condell, seven years later, to produce the folio of Shakespeare's work. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to holler around. So why didn't Shakespeare publish during his lifespan like Johnson and Marlowe? No idea. No idea, Steve. But for me, that's one of the great questions. Here's a guy that produces plays that are clearly meant to be read. And we'll see that tonight. I'll show you a couple instances of that. Plays that are clearly meant to be read, and yet doesn't seem to have taken any care to make sure that the words and George are on there. At least that we know. We don't know. One of the things that Hemings and Condell say in their preface, let me skip ahead here. Yeah. Oh, locum tenet. Yeah, that's a, it's a line from Horace's is uh, the art of poetry. It's uh, and you can't see the words in the back. It's singular, kike locum teniant, 
Sortita de Kenter. It means uh, everything in its place, really. That's what it means. It means well, all genres in their appropriate place. De Kenter is appropriate. Sortita is sorted. And then uh, this, this, this is interesting. This little uh, model here, uh, also from Roman colored arts. Neke me ut viratur perva laboro. And hence is Tokia Lectoris, which means, and uh, for me, uh, I don't work for the wonder of the crowd. I'm contented with a few readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I published this big book. Right? <laughs> Johnson's a wonderful poet, but he does, he is a little full of himself, and thank goodness. Anyway, if we, we jump ahead here, this is the what you have in front of you. And uh, one of the things, uh, one of the things that, that Hemis and Pantel are absolutely um, uh, intent on is making sure that people buy this book. They put a lot of effort into it. Because if you read through the first paragraph, you can see they're interested in people buying this book. They put a lot of effort into this, and they want to make some money off it. From the most, to the great variety of readers, from the most able, and you see that long S. I'll talk a little bit about the long S in a bit. Uh, from the most able, to him the kid would spell. There you are numbered. We'd rather you were away, especially when the fate of all books depends upon your capacity, and not of your heads alone, but of your curses. <laughs> oh, well, it's now public, and you will stand for your privileges, we know, to read and censure. Do so, but buy it first. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best commended book, the station, it says. The station was the, the, the bookseller or the publisher. Uh, then, how odd soever your brains be or your wisdom, make your license the same and spare not. Judge your six pence worth, your shillings worth, your five shillings worth at a time or higher. So you rise to the just rates you want. The, the book went for about a pound. In today's dollars, that would be about 150. So it was an expensive book. It was an expensive book. Uh, whatever, but whatever you do, buy. Center will not drive a trade or make the jack go, make the uh, donkey go. And though you be a magistrate of wit and sit on the stage at black fires or the cockpit to a rain plays daily, no, these plays have had their trial already and stood out all heathens. They do now come forth quitted, quitted by a degree of court than any purchase letters of commendation. The, when they talk about the plays, this is the Blackfriars Playhouse, a conjectural reconstruction. But you can see the, that there are some characters sitting on the sides of the stage. You can actually play to sit on the stage. That's what Hemmings and Condell talked about. You, you know, you pay to sit on the stage to a rain plays daily. Uh, but that's the Black Forest, uh, early indoor playhouse. Um, there's some window lighting, but there's a lot of, they also introduced indoor lighting for the first time. And the Globe, Shakespeare's Theater, of course, plays were put on in the afternoon because it was an open air theater. Uh, Let's go back a bit. Okay, so that's Johnson. Uh, a little bit about the folio in general. A folio, of course, you take a piece of paper and you fold it once. And that creates two leaves or four pages. That's a folio. That's a big book. For a, the equivalent of a paperback was the quarto where you take the same sheet of paper and you fold it twice. A smaller book, you get more pages out of one sheet. And that's a smaller book, the quarto. Half of Shakespeare's plays were published in quarto form uh, during his life. But it's not clear, Steve, whether he had any control over that. A lot of his, his plays were were uh, were pirated. There's a we have we have two quarto versions of the play Hamlet. The first quarto version is what's called the memorial reconstruction. Some actor who was in Hamlet goes to a publisher afterwards and says, look, hey, I know that I know Hamlet. I'll recite it for you. You write it now, we'll publish it, we'll make some money off that. 
And that's what they did. And we actually know which role the guy played, because those are the only lines he gets. <laughs> <laughs> he played the character of Marcellus. That's a memorial reconstruction, so some of the portals are very bad things. Very bad things. Uh, okay, so uh, there are about 750 <coughs> copies made. And a lot of this is conjecture, but scholars have put so much work into this that uh, I'm sure they're, they're pretty close. 750 copies. We have about 235, I think, still left in the world. Uh, they just discovered uh, two more. Uh, one in, in northern France two years ago, and then just this year. So another copy was discovered in Scotland. So I'm curious, Jim, what does a good copy go for? What's its value on the market? For I think $7 million. I think. I think it's in that, that range. Okay. I, I generally don't look at those numbers. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the most important books in print. You know, it's a, it's a, a remarkable artifact of Western culture. And the important thing is, without the folio, 18 of these plays would have been lost. Um, let's see, we've got a Merry Wives of Wind. Okay, so some of the plays that were never printed before. And uh, as you like, Taming of the Shrew, All's Well, Twelfth Night, Winter's Tale. Uh, a few of the history plays. Henry Gave was never published before. Uh, and let's see, and Coriolanus was never published. Timon, Julius Caesar, Macbeth, Anthony and Cleopatra. We would not have Anthony and Cleopatra. I don't know if you every we've all read Romeo and Juliet in high school. That's because Romeo and Juliet's a, a uh, an adolescent love story. Mm -hmm. Anthony Cleopatra is an adult love story. What's more satisfying for most adults? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and the big difference is this, that, that Romeo and Juliet, neither Romeo and Juliet are in, in control of their world. That's part of the problem. The problem. Anthony and Cleopatra, they're adults. They're in control of their world. In fact, they're in control of everybody else's world. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes a big difference in the progress of the, the love of And we wouldn't have a simile. So we'd be missing some really great plays. Uh, the Tempest. Yeah. One of us. Anyway, so one of the things Hemings and Condell did was they they brought together all of the works that they knew to be by Shakespeare. Uh, there's one play that's not on the list here, Troilus and Cressida. We know that Troilus and Cressida was planned to be in this because we have it, it was going to appear after Romeo and Juliet, the third play in the tragedies, because we have some pages where the last page of Romeo and Juliet on the other side is the first page of Troilus and Cressida. But then the editors had some problem. It used to be thought that they had a problem with gaining the rights to uh, to the play, to us and Cressida. But uh, now it's believed that they simply got a hold of a better copy, uh, and they were in, in this. There, no two folios are alike. They were making changes all the way through the printing process. They would stop the press and make a change. So we have a lot of different folios out there, basically. But then, so then, at the end, they squeezed Troilus and Cressida in at the head of the tragedies, the first play in the tragedies, but they'd already printed the, the uh, contents page, so there's no indication of that. Uh, what else? Uh, it was printed by William and Isaac uh, Jagger and Edward Blount. Uh, they, two different publishing companies that came together in this venture. That was the first folio. It was, uh, they, we know that there were a number of different compositors, the guys who actually set the type for this. Uh, it, it used to be believed that we knew who they were by the kinds of mistakes they made and the kind of spellings they used. Remember, spelling was not at all standardized during this time. So we have one compositor who always spells do, D-O-E. And another one that always spells do, D-O. Another one that spells go, G-O. And another one that spells go, G-O-E. And we used to distinguish between compositors on those bases. 
But uh, that's not really a very good basis. And the spelling is wild at the time. We have two pages we believe are in Shakespeare's handwriting. And in one line, he spells the word country three different ways. <laughs> there was no sense that you needed to spell. And as we'll see a little later, if spelling was bad, punctuation was all over the place. <laughs> you know, it was centuries before people learned how to use a comma. <laughs> Personally, I think we're still trying to figure it out. Right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, what else? Uh, first folio, 1623. Uh, the second folio, which was basically the same, except we had a new publishing company outfit working on it, because uh, Isaac and William Jaggers had passed away. But that's uh, basically the same, and that's in 1632. That's the second folio. And then we get the third folio in 1663. And in the third folio, we have seven new plays. Shakespeare wrote some more stuff after he died, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we have seven plays. Shakespeare became so popular that people were putting his name on everything. There are poems all over that, all over the place that people say by William Shakespeare. Nobody believes that except young scholars who are trying to make a name for themselves by claiming that this work that everybody knows could have been by Shakespeare. But uh, so they had seven plays, only one of which is accepted uh, pretty universally as one of as Shakespeare's play now, her. And that's the edit to the tragedies. Um, yeah, questions? So that's the formula. That's sort of the basic details of it. Um, we don't know the extent to which Shakespeare was involved in this. Notice what Hemings and Condell say. So the beginning of the second paragraph. It had been a thing we confessed, worthy to have been witched that the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writings. That suggests that he didn't. That Shakespeare didn't have any part of this. He didn't set them forth. He didn't oversee them. He didn't edit his own work. <laughs> and, you know, if you know, we find it hard to read Shakespeare sometimes, there, we can take faith from the fact that how many of Condell didn't know what he was talking about either sometimes? <laughs> they're reading this stuff and they're trying to think, what to make of this? I want to see some examples of that, but um, Shakespeare had this gift, this incredibly fertile literary imagination and linguistic facility. He was just all over the place. The puns are just all over. And the problem with puns is that you don't know which way to go with them. Anyway, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's see. So here's our, our uh, Blackfriars Theater. Here's a little map of the London theaters. So in the upper right-hand corner, you see the theater. The theater was the first professional theater in London. It was built in 1576 by James Burbage, the father of Richard Burbage, the great Eugene. The theater was built on land owned by a guy named Giles Adler, who's a, a, a Puritan. In the mid-1590s, Allen decides that his land can be put to a much more holy use than these plays. So he decides not to renew the lease. Two days after Christmas, the players go there at night, and they take apart the building, the theater. Because mm -hmm. Allen owned the land, but he didn't own the building. They take the building apart, timber by timber, and they cart it across the river. <laughs> and they rebuild it. Wow, that's a long <laughs> Shakespeare who was closely associated. Uh, Blackfriars, we see Blackfriars right here. This dark line, this dark outline is the London city limits. And the theaters were not allowed to exist within the city limits. They had to go out in the suburbs with the, with the brothels and the, the better bars. Uh, Black, Blackfriars exist within city limits, but they weren't allowed to put on plays there. But they put on plays there because they they had this deal where they just used child actors. <laughs> the children of St. Paul's, there was another group. So there were groups putting on plays around town within the city limits. They were all children. And the players were getting pissed off because they were taking their business. 
much more convenient than that to go out into the sticks to see a plant. Anyway, so those are the, uh, the next one is, that's uh, the cockpit, uh, the, also called the phoenix. It's uh, another play, mentioned, another playhouse mentioned by Hemmings and Condell. It was designed by Inigo Jones, the father of English architecture. Okay, this is the first page of the first play in the fall of the tennis. And one of the things you see here is that we've got a stage direction. The very first thing, okay, so you're standing around the bookstall in London, you see this big, sumptuous volume. You flip it open to the front page, and you encounter this stage direction. A tempestuous noise of thunder and what we heard. The interesting thing about this is this is a very literary stage direction. If you look at all the stage directions, they're very practical. Thunder. That's all. But this is very literary. There's nothing practical about this stage direction. Uh, tempestuous, that's not going to help a stage manager put us, uh, you know, know what to do on stage. Lightning, well, nobody hears lightning, you know that, right? So a tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning heard. That's a stage direction that's meant to appeal to a student, not to a stage manager at all. It's not practical, it's literary. So we see a sign at the first page, we see a sign that Hemmings and Condell are editing this book to make it a more attractive reading experience. And how do we know that was Hemmings and Condell? Well, we assume it was. Yeah, we assume it was. It's an assumption. I mean, one of the things about the, the premise is we see right there what their emphasis is. Let's take a look at that, that second paragraph. So in that first paragraph, we see, they want you to buy the book. Please, buy the book. Whatever you do, buy. But look at that. The wonderful second paragraph. In a minute, thing we confess, worthy to have been wasted, the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writers. But since it hath been ordained otherwise, and he by death departed from that right, we pray you do not envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them. And so to have published them. Uh, as where before you were abused with divers stolen and surreptitious copies, those quarto texts, uh, made and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors. <laughs> but it's told them. Even though are now offered to your, your cured and perfect of the winds, and all the rest absolutely enough, as he conceived them. Who, as he was a happy imitator of nature, was the most gentle expressor of it. His mind and hand went together, and what he thought he uttered with that decency <coughs> that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. But it's not our problems who only gather his words and give them to you to praise him. Is yours to read them. And there we hope to your divers' capacities you will find enough book to draw and hold you for his wit and no more lie hid than it could be lost. Read him, therefore, again and again. And if and you do not like it, surely you're in some manifest danger not to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and here we nice nice pitch for teachers here. And so we leave you to other of his friends who, if you need, can be your dog. But if you need them not, you can lose yourselves and others in such readers we wish you. But, but see, you see the emphasis on reading here. They wanted people to see this as a reading experience. These were plays. It was, wasn't that long since Johnson that published his plays and people weren't sure that these were. The academics dismissed them. Uh, the Puritans sure hated this stuff. <laughs> they were sure that all, you know, all the evils of the world were emanating from the playhouse. So I think that's one indication of, of Hemings and Condell's emphasis on, on making this a good reading experience. Uh, so even if they weren't themselves doing the, the editing, and I think they probably were, they, I think they probably knew Shakespeare's plays better than anybody. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Who is the who? Good question. I don't know. What was the question? I assume. Have you seen Certainly one name. I don't know if it might fit any of the other 
I doubt it was anybody taking it down. We copy what the non existent. Going to the public, I mean, was it typical of playwrights to find the kind of people that work secret so they wouldn't be pirated? I mean, is this their, you know, this is their living, so yeah, and then he gets out, yeah, yeah, folks start putting on place. There was a, the Stationers Guild had what's called the Stationers Registers. By law, they were allowed to regulate plays, to regulate any, all publications. And so there was a, a book called the Stationers Register. And in order to prevent somebody else from uh, from stealing your work, you had to list your work in the, in the Stationers Register. Of course, the Stationer charged you for that. <laughs> that benefit, right? So, and if you got to some, if you got to the station or register with the, you know, with the right amount, before the owners of the work, well, it was yours. You had the right to print it, to publish it, and they didn't. And there are some works that are listed in the station's register that were never published. They were listed in the station's stationer's register just to preclude their being published by anybody else. Because, like you said, you know they. Like you suggested, the, the players wanted to keep a handle on their stuff. They wanted to keep it secret. They wanted that script to be theirs alone to use. Right? Once you start publishing it, you know, it gets, who wants to buy us to do it? You know, good question. <clears throat> what are we doing for time? We've got a half hour. Okay, good. Okay, so that's the tempest. So now, okay, yeah, okay. But the big problem for Evans and Condell was Shakespeare himself. He was such an incredible writer that he loved playing with language. And he did so in ways that you come to a line, you don't know what to do. So here's, a, here's an example of that. This is a, a scene from Hamlet. Don't forget about the first quarter. We'll see that a couple lines from the first quarter in the next slide. But this is the second quarter. Now, this is Hamlet's first soliloquy. Hamlet has discovered that, you know, his father's not dead, right? He's, uh, and he's trying to deal with this, this idea that his mother, two months after his father's death, has buried his uncle. He doesn't know how to deal with this. There's real, real problems. And in the second quarter, which I think is the best thing to have. Hamlet says, he started the first line of his first little book, he says, Oh, that this too to Sally, Sally flesh with milk, thaw and resolve itself into a good. The word Sally, S-A-L-L-I-E-D, is the, the Elizabethan spelling for Sully. It means dirty. So Shakespeare's creating a poem here. Sally sounds a lot like solid. And the context calls for solid. Oh, that this flesh is too solid to melt and go and resolve itself into a dude. It's too solid to do that. But Shakespeare uses the word solid as this pun that begins one of the play's main themes, this idea that existence itself is dirty. That to be solid is to be sullied. Right? <laughs> We become impure simply by virtue of, of being alone. And nobody escapes it. But we see that in Hamlet's later lines. He's, <clears throat> after his great soliloquy, he encounters Ophelia. And he has the great empty to a nunnery speech. He says, I am myself indifferent honest. I'm as honest as they come. And yet I could accuse myself of such things that it would better my mother than never before. And he says to Ophelia, he says, be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. You won't escape being insulted. <coughs> in fact, in 1990, there was a little bit of, a little uh, Shakespeare criticism that went on in the pages of the Dear Ivy couple. <laughs> well, some woman wrote in saying, my daughter comes home from high school telling me that Hamlet tells Ophelia to get me to a nunnery, not a really slang for a problem. <coughs> yeah, the woman should bend out all, well, they don't let us think about this. Not a really problem. So this back and forth between Abby and this other woman, and other people jump in, and finally Abby consults her, her local Shakespeare experts and Hollywood librarian, 
Who tells her, no, of course not. Nunnery really is a convent. Not. Hamlet is telling Ophelia to get to a convent. Well, they're both like That's the whole point, is that a convent, even a convent, women as pure as ice and chase the snow, won't escape being called whores. Uh, just by being alive, by being solid, we're all sad. I think of that great ending of Woody Allen's movie, Manhattan. He's, uh, he's got this sort of great Casablanca like part of the scene at the end of the movie. And uh, uh, Mariel Hemingway is about to leave because she's 17, you know, he's, Woody Allen's in his 40s, he's having this affair with a 17 year old. She's about to run off to London to like ballet school or something. He says, he's begging her not to go. He said, don't come. You're going you're gonna to go away. You're going to get, you know, you come back like the rest of us and jerk. You know, you're so immediate and innocent now. If you go away, you're going to come back changed. And she looks him in the eyes. He says, everybody gets corrupted. Wonderful, wonderful. Like that's Hamlet. That's what's going on in Hamlet here. But Hemmings and Gardell, they read this line. They don't know what the hell to do with it. What do you do with it? What's that do? They're saying, well, surely Shakespeare meant solid. So they change the word to solid, and the pun gets lost. <laughs> the pun gets lost. So already we see Shakespeare's this wonderfully fertile creative, a literary imagination being stomped down by his editors. <laughs> it's too, too solid fleshy. And so you're a contemporary editor, what do you do? You're too solid? Or you don't sell it. Or maybe you, you take a risk. You twist wasabi. And you have a little footnote explaining to the readers that what was going on here. So the problem with literature, though, with, with a text like this, is my idea of what's right here is based on my interpretation of Hamlet. And every person has their own interpretation. Right, so you've got to make these judgments based on your best sense of you know, what's going on in the play. Anyway. So did the audience get it then? Yeah, they could totally always get it? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think they did. I think, you know, this stuff is meant to be read there. Right? That's going to just right off the audience's head. Popular, right? though. Huh? This place was popular, weren't they? Immensely popular. Immensely popular. Uh, so, they're great plays. <laughs> that was so great to read, too. Yeah, so they say, oh, that's Shakespeare. I don't understand them, but I enjoy them. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's still, you know, you get a sense of the, the human interaction, right? Whether or not you get the, the little puns. I mean, Shakespeare's slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. You've all heard that line, right? Do you not believe that there's no little line to face the sleep? Slings and arrows, they don't go together. You know what I mean? Why do you say bows and arrows? Why do you say slings and stones? So he says slings and arrows, and you start looking at the play, and what's scattered throughout this play? He's got things joined together by a conjunction. But don't go together. Why does he do that? Well, it's just one little way that Shakespeare creates this idea of, as Hamlet says, the kind is out of joy, the cursed spite that ever I was born to say. So we see the slings and arrows, this little text that just goes over everybody's head. I don't think anybody noticed this until a, a, a scholar named George Wright in the early 80s published an article saying, slings and arrows, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and the whole rest of us said, duh, of course. <laughs> you know, we didn't notice that. But that's the great thing about scholarship. You know, John's looking at this, trying to really figure out how does Shakespeare create his how does, he, how does he move readers and audiences? <coughs> Next slide. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first quarto. So this is this is put into the book. Hamlet has made his, his mind up to commit the action that he's been going back and forth, back and forth about all fight. He's going to do it. He's going to commit himself to this act of revenge, this act of violence. And everybody's going to die. Uh, in the first quarter, if danger be now, and then by then it is not to come, there's a predestined 
providence in the fall of the sparrow. But it barely has the right words. That's the first fall. But then the second floor of text, there is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. Readiness is all, since no man of all he means knows what is to leave the time. So, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Hemings and Condell say. They're looking at this and what was Will talking about here? So they try and figure it out. They're, okay, there's a special providence in the fall of the We've got that one. If it be now, it is not to come. Okay. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. All right, that's pretty good. The readiness is all. Okay. What's that next phrase? Since no man of what he leaves, no good is to leave the tongues. Well, they, they change it to since no man has what of what he leaves. The idea you can't take it with you. Right? Pretty conventional idea. And what does it leave the people? What is it to leave the times? The times means early. What does it matter whether you leave early? That you don't have anything you can, you know. And, uh, and that's what how does it come down to the line? I think it's nonsense. We can change their act by right? Since no man of what he leaves knows. Since none of us know it, the end of the great soliloquy. Hamlet's big question, big problem is that we don't know what happens after that. Thus conscience makes cowards of us all. He gets to the end of the plan, it's a whole new problem. The problem isn't that we don't know what comes after death. The problem is that we don't know what comes before death. Since no man knows anything about what he leaves, what does the matter with him? And that's that point at which Hamlet, that skepticism, that's the point at which Hamlet's able to give himself the action, but that gets lost in the food game. Hemings and Condell didn't know how to reach Shakespeare either. It's a challenge for all of us. It's not just a challenge for high school kids. And it's not just a challenge for us. I could read Shakespeare without take footnotes. You know, I've been studying this stuff my whole life. It's a, it's stuff is a challenge. And it's a challenge for all of us. So, oh, here's one more. This is the really, this is fun. So there's a line in Tempest where Ferdinand, Ferdinand is betrothed to Miranda, whose name means to wonder. Well, Prospero puts on this great show from his, by his magic. He uses his magic to put on this wonderful display for Ferdinand. And Ferdinand's just, he's, he's wowed by this. He says, oh, let me live here ever. So rare a wonder father and a wise makes this place paradise. There's that long S, wise. Almost all the folios say wise. But then, so we got the four folios, they all say wise. Uh, then we get to 1709, it's the first modern edition of Shakespeare by an Englishman named Nicholas Rowe. And Nicholas Rowe was the first one to say, wait a minute, surely one of the things that makes this place paradise for Ferdinand is his wife, Miranda. So where are one their father and a wife makes this place paradise? And it just so happens, people thought it was wise because it rhymes with paradise, sort of. And paradise comes in the middle of the line, you'll get lines between the end of the line and the middle of the line, line but wise. So Rose said wise should have been wife. Probably the, the compositors got it wrong. And the only way that the, the S, the long S, differs from the F is it doesn't have that little nib on, on the right side. That's what distinguishes it from its F. So what does that there are a couple copies, there's long rumored, there is rumored that there are a couple copies of the folio that had wife. So in the early the 80s, I guess, this woman, Jean Addison Roberts, great scholar, she decided she's going to look at every single copy of the folio under high intensity magnification and wife. And she does, and she discovers that there are a handful of folios that say wife. What happened? She discovers one where that little that little nib on the F is breaking off. See, we pointed that. I don't know if you held it in the face later. 
but she discovers one copy where that little cross bar on the end is in the process of breaking off, and she finds another copy where this is little piece of net is like floating around the world. <laughs> 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 and we're left with so rare, but wonderful thing. But a wise. And Miranda gets cut out of the <laughs> so so anyway, so once Roe suggests this in 1709, editors go back and forth. Well, some think it should be wise, some think it should be wife. So here Roberts comes in 1980 and discovers that the real fact. I mean in Shakespeare studies, it kills for this kind of fact. Right? We know now that those compositors meant to see wife. And the little bit cross like that broke off. <laughs> so what I understood, you think they changed it back to the right? No. <laughs> no, they and then get editors arguing, well, the compositors must have made a mistake to begin with. So the only just uh, <laughs> Anyway, it's just a little fun fact about the whole And the tempest the, the folio is our only copy of the tempest. We don't have any other version, so it's authoritative. So you have to decide whether Bernie likes his father-in-law, but more than his wife. <laughs> okay. Look at the last thing. Let's go back to. There we go. That was what they say about shit. They said. Uh, the rest, yeah, absolutely their numbers. As you can see, the who, as he was a happy indicator of nature, was the most gentle expression of it. His mind and hand went together. And what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. There's an edit. This is, it doesn't make any changes. It just comes right up. Well, in 1640. Ben Johnson publishes yet another one of his folios. Only now, Ben Johnson's dead. He dies three years before that. And his publishers print a new edition of his folio and they include a work that um, Johnson's own personal book, something he never planned to publish. So here we are. It's six, uh, it's, uh, Years after Shakespeare died, a few years after Johnson died, we find his notebooks, and in his notebook, his private personal notebook, he says, I remember the players. Remember the players have often mentioned that it's an honor to Shakespeare that in his writing whatsoever he pens he never plotted a line. My answer has been, what he had plotted a thousand, <laughs> which they thought a malevolent speech. I had not told posterity this. That is, I didn't see this in public. I didn't see this in public. I had not told posterity of this, um, but for their ignorance. I told them that for, you know, to, to wise them up a bit. Who chose that? Because they chose to commend Shakespeare for something that was a fault. The idea that he never bothered a woman. And to justify my own candor, for I love the man, and to honor his memory on the side idolatry as much as any, he was indeed honest of an open and free nature, and an excellent fancy, great notions and gentle expressions, where he flowed with that facility that sometimes it was necessary he should be stopped. <laughs> he was too good. It's just stuff just flows out. I mean, you can see that in so many ways, once you, you start looking for it in Shakespeare, ways in which he just, it's just, it's just coming out of him. So Flamina de Serra, in Latin for he, he should have put on the brakes. <laughs> But he redeemed his vices with his virtues. There was ever more in him to be praised. And that's that's where uh, Hemings and Condell leave it in their their preface. You know, we read him, therefore, and again and again. And if they do not like him, sure, he was a manifest danger. <laughs> That's all I got. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. We know what kind of uh, script the actors were. Well, they wanted a lot. A couple. We, we know they had. We're both Valley, which were Shakespeare's 
and written manuscripts. And they were they would be, you know, amended. That's the thing about authorship. We know that you know, okay, Shakespeare wrote these plays, but once you start putting on a play and you get people on the stage, you realize, oh, this doesn't work, that has to be changed, right? So there were a lot of changes. Those are foul papers. Those that script with the changes on it. Who do you know those exist today? Mm-hmm. We do have some copies of foul papers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what both plays we do. And, and then there are fair papers, which all those changes are made and a clean copy is produced. And that would have been ultimately the, the script that they would use. I was I was astonished to read that the folio in uh, in sixteen twenty three was there there's two references to Stratford, to the Swan of Avon and the Stratford Monument. And I read that that was actually the first occasion in, in the in the historical record that connected that place and that man from that place as the author of the plays. Right. And, and so as you say, you know, it's either someone named Shakespeare or, yeah, yeah, or yeah, someone yeah, named yeah, Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the notion of there was never a block, and so the notion that what you know what we really received was sort of the edited final copies, right. and and the notion that during his lifetime there there is no direct documentary evidence of of you know of that yeah. person as an author and as the author of this magnificent work. Yeah, well, well the, I mean there is. I mean the place to go for that is the Sam the Show book. Uh, in the 70s, published a document of Shakespeare, a documentary life, which is really trying to tell the story of Shakespeare's life by the documents that we actually have. And, you know, people say we don't know a lot about Shakespeare. Well, we do, because there's just a lot of scholarly effort put into it. And in fact, we know before he retired from the London theater scene, he bought the second largest house in Stratford uh, to retire to. So, I mean, it's not as if there's no connection. But did he write? But did he write? Well, and the town celebrate them while he was living there. They did. I mean, in, in small ways. I mean, Falstaff was the most famous character at the time. I mean, it was a, a with, associated with Shakespeare. Everybody knew Shakespeare's plays. He was the most popular sh- uh, playwright of the day. Stratford? Well, we don't know that it was, we can't say it was the guy from Stratford, but mm-hmm. since Ben Johnson knew him best, and Hemmingson Tom Bell, and they referred to Swan of Avon, right? We, we assume they know what they're talking about. Yeah. So a lot of the, he wrote for actors. Um, yep. How much contribution would the actors have put into the audience? See, I, there's no evidence for this, but I think it's immense. I think he wrote Hamlet to Richard Burbage, and he sat down with Richard <laughs> Burbage and told him how to act. In fact, we have lines in Hamlet where Hamlet is talking to the actors and says, look, this is the way to play it. You can't play it this way, the way most actors do. You can't do that anymore. Because we've got a serious, serious elements for play under consideration at each moment. So you've got to pay attention to this. So we look at Hamlet's, I look at Hamlet's lines to the players as Shakespeare's advice to Burbage. Because really they were they were producing a new kind of play. A play that where the story of Hamlet, it's a revenge tragedy, which means really that supposedly that what's important is all the violence, but there's not a whole lot of violence at the end. There's one murder in the middle, but really the story of Hamlet's not that story. The story of Hamlet is the story of the internal struggle of this guy to understand his life. You know, what's the right way to act? Danish culture says you will your father's death. Christian culture says you can't do that. Revenge is all over You see those Hamlet being tugged between those two extremes, and that's the story. That's what grabs us about Hamlet. And I think of Hamlet as the most intelligent play ever written, with the stupidest thing everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James. You know, you mentioned the the, uh, the, the I guess, the compilers of the volume, they really encourage um, that the book be read. Yeah. And I guess my assumption would be is that there's a very small percentage of um, English society at that time that knew that. Right. 
that it was what the well the aristocratic class. The only ones that could afford a hundred dollar book. Yeah. yeah. What did that um, represent? Like a hundred fifty pounds of that, like, you know, six months worth of wages. Or, yeah, that's. Yeah. Yeah.